Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the session on peers on the front lines. My name is Francis Joseph. I'm the regional coordinator of the network of Asian people who use drugs based in Bangkok, Thailand, and I work in the Asia region. Outreach, outreach as the session talks about peers. So outreach is the most effective approach to prevent HIV transmission amongst people who inject drugs. When done through peer-led outreach within harm reduction service delivery, including distribution of needles and syringes, peers are the pillars. Peers are the pillars of the harm reduction programs and outreach workers have a strong peer network that effectively enables access to harm reduction services within the HIV and health service delivery. In this session, we will hear the experience of, uh, experiences of our friends from, uh, from Myanmar, from Bangladesh, and from Australia uh, on the different approaches that has been adopted in the country context and playing a crucial role on peers on the front lines. And of course, towards improving work policies and practices for peer workers. So without much ado, I would like to introduce our friends and colleagues here with me on this panel. We have Nilar Shweyi from Myanmar. We have Dr. Shahidul Islam from Bangladesh. We have Brit, Liam, and Baden from Victoria, Australia. I would like to invite I would like to invite our first speaker, Mrs. Nilar Shweyi from Myanmar. Uh, Nilar is currently working as the head of the monitoring and evaluation department at the Asian Harm Reduction Network based in Yangon, Myanmar. She has 10 years of working experience in harm reduction programs. She's passionate about harm reduction services for people who use drugs and worked in the remote areas of Myanmar. She will be presenting, uh, her presentation focuses on glimpses of peer leadership as a prevailing solidarity model, a road to peer-led harm reduction. So over to you, Shweyi, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to present my presentation. On behalf of Dr. Pyeong Shui Miao, original presenter is Dr. Pyeong Shui Mao, who do not get the visa. Therefore, I am presenting for him. Now, I am go to the, my presentation, A Road to PR-Led Ham Reduction. Okay, my country, Myanmar, is beautiful. It's located in Southeast Asia, and but we civilians as well as people who use drugs and inject drugs are suffering from the war, like Ukraine. But our is civil war. Myanmar is located in the nearby India, Bangladesh, China, Laos, and Thailand. And Myanmar is one of the world's top heroin and ADS producers. It has 93,000 PWID who are disproportionately affected by blood-borne infections. And effect of the country economic and collapse has sustained as a result of COVID-19 pandemic and political crisis. According to the survey results of Ministry of Health, HME prevalence of among PWID is 34.9%. This crisis made at rise spots, lockdowns, and mobile restrictions of clients. In 2021, we promoted the urgent need to innovate community PR lead responses to continue harm reduction services in conflict affected area. And let me move to another topic of project setting. Kale, part of the Zagai region, it's located on the way to Tamu, More, India, Bora, and major drug trafficking area. To fill the gap of harm reduction services in Myanmar, Asian Harm Reduction Network has been providing critical life-saving 
Harm reduction services for our targeted population, including people who use drugs, inject drugs, their sexual partner, family members, and remote areas in Sakai, Kachin, and Northern Shan State. This is a region. These are the also prolonged conflict affected areas in Myanmar. And another slide is what we do, how we have the, our service provisions of HRN to our targeted population. We have actually two service delivery model, facility-based and community-based model. When you look at the, this graph, you will see the, sorry. When you look at the, this picture, you will see the, our service provisions to targeted populations. And uh, allow me to talk about more the community-based model. We are uh, expanded the community PR-led harm reduction interventions in Calais Township. We also created and trained 21 residents at PR, Irish worker, counselor, needed petroperia to take lead in community-based harm reduction services in 2021. Let's see. PR outreach workers are supervising needed petrol beer in hits assigned outreach sites and distributions on needed syringe, condom, INC material, head educations, and awareness session. They are also providing the referral support for HME testing services, STI testing and treatment services, methadone maintenance therapy, hepatitis B and C screenings, and overdose management with Nileso. And another uh, recruited, we also the, recruited the PR counselor. They are also providing the HME screening, counseling, HME referral for care and treatment in Calais Township. And we also recruited the Nita Petro PR. They are also providing the distribution of Nita syringe, condom IEC material, and they also collected the discard NS, NS and needed and syringe, and referral support for HME testing services and care and treatment in remote area. According to the Algen result, I will present the PWID reach in Calais project site from 2022 to 2021. 22% uh, out of total PWID reach through PR channel in 2021. Why in 2020? It is 11% in 2020. And another again result, we have noted down HME testing services in Calais projects from 2020 to 2021. 32% out of total distribution were reported by PR counselor. And while in 2020, it is only the 16%. And another organ result is needed patrol program in Calais Township projects from 2020 to 2021. 60% out of total distributions are distributed by Nita Petro PR. One in 2020, it is only the 65%. As you know, PR community outreach is an entry point to accept their care and treatment for hand reduction services. Inclusions of PR is a community and communi uh, community and outreach support work has a further proven to be a most appropriate strategy uh, to reach new clients and to maintain our existing clients. I would like to conclude my presentation with the following reason. Community PR-led harm reduction enhances strong sense of ownership. It is a key for the successful implementation of this model through training, community acceptance, providing travel allowance, and technical assistance. Implementation of this model is one of the alternative ways to overcome the widespread slowdowns and mobile restrictions of clients. Implementing community PR-led harm reduction might be the major part of providing harm reduction services now and in the future. To conclude my presentation with the key messages, peers are in the community for the community. And I acknowledge the support of my organization, Asia and Ambassador, and also the other organization, other hand organizations are providing in our hand reduction services. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Shwai. That was an excellent presentation. And despite the tribulation faced by people who use drugs, who are suffering because of the warlike situation in Myanmar, uh, it, uh, similar to Ukraine, there's a political crisis and uh, the community actually took lead despite the odds and you were able to successfully deliver community-based services for the community, by the community. And uh, that was an excellent presentation of uh, peer outreach worker, peer counselor, and of course, needle patrol peers. And uh, yeah, uh, you can further uh, follow uh, their work on Best Shelter Myanmar, which is here, uh, it, which was in the presentation. It's bestsheltermyanmar.org. Thank you so much for this presentation. I would like to call upon Dr. Shahidul Islam from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Dr. Islam <clears throat> is a medical graduate with a diploma in STD AIDS and a master's in public health and comes with a 20 years of working experience in public health. He's currently working with Save the Children, uh, Save the Children in Bangladesh and is currently overseeing the implementation of people who inject drugs interventions, especially works with the network of people who use drugs and the network of positive people in Bangladesh as a senior manager. He's also contributed and developed various guidelines, especially I would like to highlight that he has been part of developing the prevention of mother to child transmission guidelines for the ART program that focuses specifically for women who are spouses or are themselves women who use drugs. Dr. Shahidul Islam would be presenting the effort to bringing professionalism amongst outreach workers to improve needle syringe programs and other essential packages to respond to sudden increase of HIV prevalence amongst people who inject drugs in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Over to you, Dr. Islam. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to present this uh, presentation. At the beginning, I should uh, say that this conference is being held on the land of the five tribes of the Kulin Nation and I wish to acknowledge them as a traditional owners. I would also like to pay my respects to their elder, past and present, and Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Uh, this is the acknowledgement for the country. Thank you. So as said, uh, this is uh, our presentation. The key presenter, uh, Ezadul Islam Choudhury, uh, he couldn't be able to uh, make to join this uh, session uh, due to his uh, some issues with, with, the, with his family. So today I'm presenting uh, what are the efforts we have uh, bring in to, to uh, create the professionalism among uh, peer outtest workers to reverse the uh, sudden increase of uh, HIV prevalence in Dhaka, especially Dhaka, Bangladesh. So little bit, uh, bit background uh, of Bangladesh. Bangladesh is uh, a country of South Asia, just neighborhood of uh, uh, Myanmar and, and India. So we have a 169 uh, million of population over there. Uh, but HIV prevalence is low in Bangladesh, is less than 0.01%. And uh, among the key population is less than one. And the estimated uh, uh, people living with HIV is around 14,000. But in 2016, uh, all of a sudden, uh, exactly the HIV, especially among people who inject drugs, rises up to 22% in Dhaka, and around 27% uh, in older part of the Dhaka. And that was a uh, thunder strike for us, because uh, we are uh, basically operating the harm reduction program since 1998. So it's a long experienced program, but it has suddenly raised. So as a response, uh, we, we try to identify the gaps and also look into the opportunities, how we can do more uh, to bring down this uh, prevalence curve to, to near about uh, like exceptional one. 
So what we did uh, in, in, in country level and also in the regional level, we did uh, rigorous consultation with in-country stakeholders and also the regional experts to, to bring in the uh, experiences how we can deal with this uh, HIV epidemic. And afterwards, we did three study. One is that evaluation of the total PWID intervention. Second one is uh, ethnographic study. It took around two years. And the third one was joint mission by the Global Fund and UNODC to find out uh, what happening in Bangladesh. And uh, they had done this rigorously. And based on that, they put some recommendation for us. One thing was that the, the existing uh, outreach service, what we are providing, it need to redesign. Second one was that uh, the needle syringe exchange program, what we are uh, providing to the uh, community, to the participant, is not sufficient enough. So we need to uh, develop a differentiated service delivery model it is for the needle syringe exchange program. And more importantly, the professionalism of the peer outreach worker because that was lacking, and that was one of the uh, important issue which uh, contributed to increase this uh, HIV epidemic. And other issues was uh, like safe disposal and waste management was not up to the standard. Then the OST program, uh, it has been uh, running since 2010, but quality was not that much to prevent the HIV uh, infection. Other issues was that uh, government ownership somehow is not that level, so it also need to be strengthened. And we didn't have any uh, prison intervention, and that was another recommendation to, uh, to start the prison intervention as early as possible, because you know that uh, the drug user community, they have uh, sometimes uh, go to prison. They uh, had some issues with the drugs because country had a zero policy for the drug. So that was a big issue that prison intervention should be in place in Bangladesh. And other factor was that uh, law enforcement agency, uh, because uh, they harassed most of the uh, people who inject drugs. So that also need to be addressed uh, uh, during this implementation phase. And another issue was the data collection and dissemination. It was poor at that time. So uh, in the current grant, uh, the uh, new funding model three, we put all these things together, and we uh, targeted that around 86% of the uh, national strategic plan target should be uh, targeted in NFM3 for the people who inject drugs. And we did that. And we also considered that if we uh, go to any in in districts, at least 90% 90, 90 of that population should be covered to uh, create some impact on, on the uh, infection rate. And also, we consider uh, uh, global 1990-90. At that time, that was 1990-90, so we put that. And we designed two different packages of services. One is the comprehensive one. That means it's a uh, complete package of harm reduction, especially for, for the uh, epidemic zone, the Dhaka, and the surroundings. And also, we designed for a very minimum service package. It's just distribution of the commodities, HIV testing, and awareness raising program for the less uh, epidemic region. And also, we uh, plan to uh, uh, integrate and, and relocate services to government, because you all know that drop-in centers can't alone provide all the health, health service needs required for the people who inject drugs. So, we uh, integrate services to the government facilities. That was also planned. And most important thing is that uh, earlier, there was no community involvement in the program. It was like a token. But this time, we plan a comprehensive uh, community engagement, like uh, recruitment of the peer outreach worker, mentoring of them, and uh, participatory monitoring. That means the, the program, whether they are uh, doing the right things in the, in the place, this community network, we call it network uh, who use uh, drugs, they are uh, doing the participatory monitoring. And also, we involve them uh, in, in the national level to, to do some advocacy with the government 
with the law enforcement agency, with the Department of Narcotics Control, and other stakeholders who uh, usually uh, sometimes uh, uh, do some uh, like uh, harassment or, or uh, some barricade to the pro uh, prevention program. So we also, also involve them in that way. So what are the initiatives uh, we took uh, to, to bring professionalism among peer artists worker? One is that uh, to, to raise their motivation. So we established a formal uh, selection or recruitment process. We reviewed the structure of, the, of their salary. It was very poor. Earlier it was uh, like $100 uh, per month. So that was increased to $150. Uh, we couldn't do much because due to, you know, that the funding and other things is not that much. And also we show a clear uh, career pathway, like one uh, uh, people who inject drugs, uh, who, who basically start as a peer volunteer, they can recruit as a peer artist worker, they can promote it as a artist supervisor, they can uh, promote it as a uh, drop-in center manager, even they can, uh, some of them, are still working as a program manager. So we show a clear path that they can, a community people can lead the program in the future. So that was also uh, uh, built in in NFM3 program. <laughs> and the last one is that we, especially Dhaka, as uh, the harassment was uh, very high because uh, due to zero drug policy, so we pairing them. So one non pair pair out this worker, pair with a peer outreach worker so that they together can do the uh, outreach activities in the field. That was done. And the capacity building initiative, a total process was uh, right now leading by the uh, uh, network of people who use drugs. And all the SOPs, guidelines, and modules, which was backdated, up, just updated uh, in the very recent times. And also, we did the basic training we uh, plan for the refresher and, and the on, on job training, and that is in place. And also we did uh, training evaluation immediately and after one month and after six months, whether the training is effective or not. And the third point was that uh, we uh, plan to, to reduce the workload to outreach worker and also reduce the harassment. Earlier, the uh, forms formats was huge, like around 60 form formats they have to uh, like fill in every time when they uh, provide services to the uh, community. Right now, it's uh, around 20. So it has been reduced. And multiple channel of uh, syringe needle distribution has been uh, in place, like uh, distribution from the facilities, distribution from the secondary channels, like uh, depot holder, distribution from vending machine, then a mobile fan. So all these sorts of uh, uh, needle distribution has been in places so that the workload of the outreach worker uh, could be reduced. And the last one is that uh, we did develop some uh, local level task force uh, chaired by the uh, local police officer so that they can sensitize and they can reduce the harassment to the uh, community. So through all these efforts, what we could uh, have now is that our turnover rate has reduced drastically. It was uh, in NFM2 was around 10 to 15% per year. Right now it's 3%. So it has been reduced. Then uh, contact with PWID in 15 days, it has been increased from uh, 81, uh, 43 to 81. And cons consistent risk has been increased to 68% uh, to 95%. And collection of shirin's needles from the sports, it has been uh, increased from 50 to 80%. And with all these efforts and other things, the uh, HIV prevalence in very last uh, IBBS held in 2020 has come down to 5%. And we think that this is the success of our program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shahidul Islam. I strongly feel that it is a matter of time to address the situation at the right time, like what was done in Bangladesh is remarkable 
to address the increasing uh, HIV incidences amongst people who inject drugs. And it was the right time for redesigning the outreach service delivery model, building skills and competencies of outreach workers, including the motivation enhancement as well as workload management, the comprehensive service package that included NSP and OAT was also you know, needed for an impactful harm reduction program, and that was also appropriately done at the right time. Thank you so much. And of course, I would also reiterate that team consistency, like you showed in the last slide, it was only 3% turnover, which is, was remarkable. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation, Dr. Shahidul Islam. I would like to now invite our friends from Victoria, Australia. Brit so on my, on my right is Brit Chapman, who is the health promotion officer with a local drug user organization, which is Harm Reduction Victoria. And then we have Liam Neal, who is a peer harm reduction practitioner at Star Health, where he works at, on the part one project, part one, party project. Party project. Yeah, in the NSP and is also a member of the FUSE network. Liam also pursues his passion for harm reduction and safer injecting through volunteering with the Harm Reduction Victoria's Dance Wise program. And last but not the least, of course, Baden Hicks, who is a senior peer support worker, works as a supervisor at Turning Point Richmond in the pharmacotherapy team. He is a passionate harm reduction advocate for drug decriminalization and legalization. He has a certificate four in AOD and is one of the leaders of the Australian Psychedelic Society Melbourne chapter. He believes the most dangerous things about drugs is prohibition. We all believe that. We all go with the same ideology. Uh, all of the three would represent the fuse network consultations and will present on identifying systemic barriers experienced by people who use and inject drugs, peer workers in Victoria through peer-led networks. Up to you. Hello. <laughs> I'm really nervous. <laughs> You're um, uh, firstly, we would like to acknowledge um, the Wurundjeri Wurrung peoples of uh, the Kulin Nations, whose land uh, we're currently on, um, and that um, sovereignty was never ceded. Um, pay respects to elders, um, past and present, and to any mob who might be with us today. Um, and I guess as we're talking about um, like systemic barriers to peer workers in the workplace. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that um, First Nations peer, uh, peer workers um, are going to experience a lot more barriers than, um, than us. <laughs> We're not First Nations. Um, so just like keeping that in mind as well as we go through this. Um, and yeah, think about the ways in which colonisation um, is, is a part of those barriers and makes really unsafe situations for everybody, but especially for First Nations people. Um, and we'd like to thank um, all the members of FUSE for their contributions, which inform the content of this presentation today. Um, I think there's like 20 of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 20 of us. Um, some of them are here today. Hi. <laughs> um, we anonymized all of the answers um, to protect the safety of everybody because not everybody um, works um, in a safe workplace, obviously. Um, so Fuse Networks is a support group for harm reduction workers with lived um, or living experience. Um, most are in peer designated roles within their organizations, but not all of them. Um, and it's 
We meet once a month, sometimes face to face, sometimes online, um, and it's a space where we can debrief and uh, debrief with and support each other and um, engage in peer centric career development together. So you know, we might like practice workshops in front of each other or do like a session on self care, for example. Um, that's specific to pianists. Um, Fuse arose due to a lack of nuanced support um, that peer workers need to overcome and deal with the structural barriers to safety at work. Um, so some of those barriers. Uh, um, the, sh the nature of the short contracts and the funding cycles. So like often you only get funding for like 12 months to the end of the financial year. So, and like quite often the government doesn't like, or the organization or both doesn't, um, like let you know that like the funding is going to continue until like a couple of weeks before mm. that year ends so like yeah you can start looking for new work um and the lack of formal acknowledgement um uh, or the lack of like measures to highlight um the value of the work that we do and the quality of our engagements um and so like these two barriers sort of make us feel like we're always like on trial, um, undervalued, um, you know, it means that we don't feel like we have job or financial security. Um, you know, that we're kind of disposable, like a commodity to the organization. Um, you're definitely like a bit of a tick box for some of them. Um, and then the fact that formal peer positions um, are pretty much non-existent at management or structural levels creates massive challenges, um, such as like perpetuating the false notions that we aren't trustworthy, um, that we are a risk to, em uh, to employ, uh, which further discourages us from applying for those management roles um, and just like seeking opportunities to affect positive change within our workplaces. Um, and it reinforces the denial of us even having those specific skill sets at all, which of course we do, like just because we take drugs, we're just normal people, yeah. Um, lack of understanding of like how we relate to service users is really common, like as peers, our interactions with or our boundaries with um, service users can look really different and so this can be misinterpreted as um, by like colleagues or supervisors of like dodgy behaviour, like oh they must be dealing drugs or something like this. Um, and that leads to sort of like the over surveillance of ourselves in the workplace, um, micromanaging and just a general distrust by everybody else. Um, and we're under constant scrutin scrutiny, which in itself is a form of persecution as well. Um, quite often, um, peer workers can be the only peer, designated peer, um, working within an organisation, um, which can mean it gets really lonely. Um, and the, you feel like there's no one to defend you if need be, like, yeah, which affects people's mental health. Um, and just like, yeah, again, plays into these mi misconceptions um, about like, yeah, what kinds of people use drugs. Um, and it also means that there's no one there to mentor you, especially if like it's the first role you've been in or something, you don't really know what you're doing. Um, you have to figure it out by yourself. Um, so you like need to have like the ability to learn on the job without any guidance whatsoever. Um, like as, yeah, have to figure out what is even possible within the scope of your role. Um, then at the same time as defending yourself and the role um, and educating others as to what your role is as you're figuring out what the hell it is. Um, so, you know, there's some pretty like complex specific skill sets needed there that can very easily be transferred to upper management positions, I feel. Um, and another one, um, organizations are really inflexible with employee management most of the time. They're like quite unwilling to like adapt support services to our specific needs. Um, yeah. This, um, so the structural denial of our skills um, and expertise makes us feel unwelcome, unsafe. It reinforces stigmatizing views of people who use drugs. Um, and it means that we're not safe to speak up. Um, our already pre precarious work security further is further compromised if we do. 
Um, but Fuse Networks um, has helped us and supported us in overcoming a lot of these barriers um, and, yeah, helping us feel a little bit more safe in the workplace or at least, like, how to cope with feeling unsafe. Um, you. Thanks, Britt. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for some of us working alone as peer support workers, we've experienced numerous systemic barriers and some of us have felt there could be stigma directed towards us for some of our drug use. And having to challenge that alone can feel difficult, which is one of the reasons I continue to organise professional development sessions around people who use drugs in a way that benefits their lives and education around living experience peer workers. Where I've had some of the FUSE members come to support me in doing those educational sessions. Also on my journey of educating the clinicians at my work, and working solo as a peer, it can feel isolating as it can for some of our other FUSE members. And having the FUSE network has been one of the biggest supports in our roles as peer workers. The FUSE network is where I have found my tribe and we're all available to support each other and also have monthly meetings where we can check in and also do educational sessions and training around different drugs and harm reduction, which is a massive support in my role and for the other members of the FUSE network in a similar situation to myself, where we can't go to another peer worker at our work for advice. It has also given us a network which has really helped people to get out of their own head and it's given us a broad, broader understandings of how to work effectively as a living experience peer support worker and has expanded the ability to do our peer work. FUSE has given us the opportunity to have open and honest conversations with other peer workers and has helped us with becoming better peer workers and deepens our understanding that this is not just about our own individual lives, but everyone's. As living experienced peer workers in the FUSE network, we've found it has helped us to recognise our personal strengths and how to define our individual sense of self and rights as employees. Living experience peer work can be hard, and some of us that are working solo in our roles as living experience peer workers, it has been the FUSE network that we've been able to turn to to be validated and have the hard work that we are doing recognised, and for myself to be pulled up when I'm working beyond my capacity in my role, which I do quite a bit. The FUSE Network has given myself and others some massive professional development opportunities where I've spoken at one of the VADA conferences last year, as well as sending Britt, Liam and myself to the New South Wales Users and AIDS Conference in Sydney, which prompted us to do the abstract for this presentation today. And also given the FUSE Network members scholarships to, to attend this conference. Being part of the FUSE Network, has given us some amazing opportunities and experiences that my workplace might not have provided itself, although Turning Point has been supportive of me taking up these opportunities. I also have one of the FUSE members doing my external supervision for work, and I feel I can be totally open and honest and be myself with that other FUSE member, whereas before I didn't feel, I could feel that way and I felt I had to be careful and selective in what I said to the previous person that was doing my supervision because of fear of stigma. The FUSE network has kept myself and others up to date on what's going on in the people who use drugs and advocacy scene and has allowed us to have our say and input so we can have our voices heard and feel we are all unified in making a change to better our lives and the lives of other people who use drugs, whether that be in a professional setting or for people who use drugs recreationally and don't work in the sector. As the only peer support worker at Turning Point in Richmond and the first peer worker at Turning Point in Richmond, the other clinicians have specific rules and guidelines that they had to work to. But as a peer worker, I'm expected to work in the gray area. The other clinicians have never worked with a peer like myself and cannot give me proper guidance on how to navigate that gray area. That's when I can turn to the other members in the FUSE network for support and guidance. The FUSE network has not only benefited myself in a really positive way, but it also has had a flow-on effect to me, for me to be a better peer worker 
and support my clients and has really changed my experience in the workplace for the better, which is what Liam is going to go on to talk about now. So I think as, um, you know, a lot of people that use drugs might kind of understand, um, the broader structures of prohibition and criminalization um, of drug use can lead to feelings of uh, shame, unworthiness, and even fear. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that the wrong workplace can really uh, reinforce those feelings. The paradox of peer work, of course, is that we are being employed um, for the same experiences, knowledge, and connection to our community uh, that we're also being criminalized for at the same time. Um, and so Fuse has been uh, so important because by connecting with other peer workers um, through the network, I think we've all really come to embrace uh, and understand the true value of our own lived experiences uh, and how that kind of relates to, to being in a peer role in, in a, a health setting. Um, and this connection with others through fears, uh, through fears really helps paint kind of a broader picture and, and gives us all a better understanding uh, of the important and the dynamic role that peers can play within a very rigid system that's really designed to, you know, treat people through abstinence and, and recovery. Um, but it's also been really great for improving us as workers. Um, so obviously, Fuse has really facilitated opportunities, as, as Baden spoke about, um, for members to not only like go through professional development training, but it's actually often us um, you know, being trained and training each other through FUSE. And I think by sharing that knowledge, um, especially the knowledge that's informed by our own lived experiences, um, it really broadens, like, you know, the knowledge of the whole network and improves kind of our capacity to do, you know, the important and dynamic work that, that we do. Um, yeah, so, you know, we are all like better place to kind of effectively engage with, with people that might be using our services um, to actually reduce drug related harm uh, and help people to navigate this system uh, that is abstinence orientated, um, you know, and with an understanding that treatment does not have to mean abstinence. Engaging with a service doesn't actually even have to mean treatment. Um, as well as uh, you know, being <laughs> improving at the work that we do and being able to demonstrate that time and time again is so important because there's so much pressure. It's a constant pressure in these services and in these roles with these really short funding cycles um, and really limited resources. So to be able to kind of, you know, gain that knowledge together and help that to and use that to improve our jobs, um, you know, really helps to kind of improve our feeling of safety in the workplace because you know, we're killing it. <laughs> um, and it's, of course, introduced us to a community. Um, so many of us are employed in the only peer role in the organization. It might be a huge organization, but there's still just one of me. Um, and of course, we lack resources, funding, support, supervision. <laughs> Uh, yeah, safety. Um, so I think through FUSE, like we've been introduced to this community of people that are in a similar or the same position as us. Um, and through that, like, you know, we gain so much support, just being able to meet once a month and talk about what's going on, get that advice, have that person to call when, you know, it all feels too much or whatever. Um, and, you know, big shout out to, to Mills down there and, and Nas as well. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really invaluable to be able to share our experiences and talk through our struggles and, and learn from each other. Um, and I think, you know, most human beings can appreciate that there is safety in community. Um, and through FUSE, we've obviously met our local community, 
through opportunities that um, Fuse has given us. We've met, you know, the national community, the Australian community. Uh, and thanks to Fuse today, we've met our international community, which is you know, amazing. Um, and so I think, you know, <laughs> it's really given me like a confidence in myself, uh, in, in my ability to, to be, you know, a good harm reduction beer worker uh, and in my experiences. So, um, yeah, so the network has really helped build our confidence in the value of our living experience and also to be able to um, help other people realize the value in their own living experience. Um, and, you know, the world is actually beginning to value or to recognize the value of peer work, and we're seeing that. But um, Fuse has really been instrumental in helping, you know, us to recognize that in ourselves. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of really well summarized by a quote from another member of the Fuse, Fuse network. So the shame associated with using drugs is not mine to hold. Rather, my workplace has a responsibility to support all of its employees and to not discriminate, discriminate about their rights to equal opportunity. Um, just to finish, oh yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, just to finish, um, we just wanted to say that like in collaborating, working together to do this presentation, um, it's been great um, to really reflect upon how lucky we are to have the Fuse Networks um, and, that, and that we deserve to have the support, you know? Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs>
forums. But my question uh, will go to the uh, first presenter. I've seen uh, the issue of peer outreach, peer counselors, and under uh, my great concern comes here, do we have peer program coordinators? We, do we have peer managers? Do we have peer accountants? Do we have people who use drugs uh, in the midst of planning, uh, implementing, uh, community-led monitoring the program? Do we have people in uh, in, 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 in your settings, like uh, people who use drugs have a say in terms or do we wait for peer uh, outreach because it's already planned, a work plan is there? Do we have such conversation? Do we have individuals in your management team that are the people who use drugs? Uh, to, 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 to the next present, I think you presented a very well elaborate data analysis, you know, uh, and, and for me, always when I hear data, it's, it's one of the things that the donors are looking for. But my question is, uh, have you guys also done the quality analysis, the quality of life versus the quantity data that you are giving us. Do they tally? Do they, are we going to go to the street uh, of, 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 of different areas and see uh, the data and the quality of life of the people who use drugs? Are we keen on that? Are we looking also our program beyond the public health and HIV and economic world for the people who use drugs? Thank you and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, I must say. Yes, please. I just thank you, you guys. Brilliant. Now, we've just employed um, four peer workers in our organisation. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, my sorry. name is Nick from the Kirkton Road Centre. I like a question. Um, now, what's interesting for me, straight off the snapshot, is that we've got four peers who are incredibly different, and I'm trying to build training and support programs that will suit all of them, and they're all at very different uh, they're all in very, they all have very different needs and requirements in terms of how they're going to do the job, what their strengths are will be in the job, because the, the jobs are, you know, it, it's an embedded um, health education officer, Jobbis and Needle and Syringe Program worker, and I've got some who have been around this for a long time, who have incredible amounts of information and knowledge to it, others far less, and others with, with very different levels of professional competency, do you know, I took notice on what you said about the sort of managerial expertise and the administrative skills, some with almost no. So I just wondered if you had any suggestions about how to sort of manage a training program that we could manage, because I'm watching some of our staff sort of trying really hard to work and figure out how to do this and get everybody up to speed to work in a similar sort of cohesive fashion um, and make the most use of everybody in the same way that anybody would. So any suggestions would be great. Thanks. Thank you so much. We have three questions. Okay, please. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hi, and my name's Andy. Um, I'm a needle syringe program worker and also an out drug user at work. So my role isn't specifically as a peer worker, but obviously the, the job um, is informed by peer work and peer workers. And I've definitely experienced the kind of discrimination that you talk about that might happen to a peer worker from um, the structure of the, where I work, and in particular, the devaluing of my skills and knowledge. And um, so I guess my question is um, to the panel, um, what do you think might be key strategies to um, get management to stop being discriminatory, given that they're actually allowed to discriminate against us? There's no law against discriminating against drug users. Uh, that's my question. Yeah. Thank you so much. Two questions are directly uh, addressed to Myanmar and Bangladesh, and then we have open questions. So. Um, can we start from Myanmar? The question. Okay. 
for the first question, for the my, uh, my responses, we have a uh, total 133 peers are involved in, in our community leave harm reduction program. We have a uh, different position, uh, peer counselor, peer need a petrol beer, beer average worker. They are providing a high reduction services and mainly focus for community prevention work, uh, activity. One prime, uh, uh, project managers manage the all average worker and all peer counselor. We have a uh, one manager for several different position peer counselor. And another point is, uh, we, had, we came with my supervisor, Martin Sa. Please help me out to complete the answer. Can you hear me? She had a very good answer. I just want to add that the, our boss, who is the founder of this organization, he himself is a user, and he's still using it. And he leads us, he guides us through that. And I love your question about community-led monitoring. We actually uh, did uh, already in the one site, which is in Weimar, right, Ketchin, and it involves everybody, uh, not only the people who use drugs, but also people with uh, HIV AIDS and sex worker. It's a group of the CSO working with the uh, UN AIDS. So they actually did the <coughs> monitoring led by the community. Actually, uh, we got a lot of responses some are mostly are good, but some are also uh, uh, we need to enhance. Now we are expanding that community-led monitoring to another site, which is also in Ketchin, Bamo. So we are hoping to continue and replica that community-led monitoring in other sites of our project. I think that's it, no? That is. Thank you for your question. Very nice. Thank you so much for supplementing that. Uh, yeah, over to you, Dr. Shah. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, especially the question uh, asked by Matthew. Uh, maybe Matthew is not here. Okay, anyway, uh, 20 is, is still huge. Uh, there's no doubt about this. So what we are planning, uh, we already have introduced one system. It's a community information system. It's a software-based uh, data collection tools. Uh, but one big challenge for, for my country is that uh, most of the PR artists worker, the education level is really poor. That is, that is one uh, important issue. But we, we also uh, tried one, one, uh, in one, one pilot project that was PMT city for the special uh, uh, women for special groups. At that point, we introduced one software and provided uh, a laptop, not laptop, it's pumped up, so that they can, uh, whether they can use that, it, uh, that uh, software and the, uh, 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 the, 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 the product. It shows that some of them can handle the uh, software and some of them not. So it's uh, really difficult and challenging for us, but it's still we have in our mind that uh, it's technology. Uh, we need to adopt that things, and that is uh, really in, 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 in our mind. So we are looking forward to do that. Uh, maybe in next coming years, we can at least introduce these things in, in especially Dhaka, not in the periphery areas, because internet connection was uh, is not that much uh, speedy outside Dhaka, so sometimes it's uh, really difficult to manage. That one thing, and second, uh, Maybe, sir, you asked the question about the uh, qualitative data. So uh, we did a three study over there. Uh, one was that, uh, uh, like, it's an evaluation of the uh, intervention, total uh, PWID intervention. Second one is the ethnographic study. And third one was the joint mission of uh, the Global Fund and the UNODC. So that part had uh, uh, definitely qualitative part. But due to time constraint and other things, uh, we didn't bring that things in, in, in the presentation. But quality part definitely is a, is a uh, good one to, to triangulate with the, with the uh, quali qualitative data. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. It was about the quality of life. So, 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 uh, sorry, Chair. Uh, just 
one, one more thing. I, I, I think uh, whatever you were saying, it's very important. But for us, for the people who use drugs, we really like to see that at a physical point and even at the written space. Uh, sorry, Chair, may I ask uh, Fuse? Uh, because Fuse is doing, it's a community-led, they are doing a very good job. I don't know how do you handle political space, the political uh, uh, space. Have you established a political will? Because uh, what I've seen <laughs> from where I come from in Kenya, if you are a community member and you are coming very uh, strongly the way you people you are, you always you won't be sh having shortage of people fighting against you. So I don't know how you've managed that, and uh, how do you deal with other allies who uh, either support you or they are against the community movement? Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, chair. Not at all. Not at all. As for the people that aren't allies, to answer your question a bit first, um, fuck them. Like, just don't have anything to do with them. We have to give, you have to uh, give three responses to Nick, Danny, and Ahmed. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, okay, key strategies for management not to discriminate. Um, I don't know, that is really hard. Like, Andy made a great point, like, you can't, um, like there's no, there's no like legislation or anything. So that, like there's no consequences if you're discriminated against um, as someone who uses drugs in the workplace. Um, even though you're in a peer role, they know that you use drugs, but then, you know, you're um, fucked over for it anyway. But um, <laughs> the first thing I thought of was like sack them. Um, but you know, you're not in the position to sack them. I don't know. Um, I think that like, like stigma and then the resulting discrimination that comes from the stigma, stigma ideas, um, like a lot of it comes from like lack of knowledge or like, um, I just like believing all of like these myths or the shit that the media, that politicians and that throw at us um, constantly all the time about who we are, but which is not true. Um, you say, tra I don't know, training, training, training. Um, I don't know, or like, I guess another thing is like, I don't know, not, not just not working for those organizations. If they can't hire a peer worker, they can't discriminate against a peer worker. But you know, I don't know. Um. I think that that's, it's a really important point to talk about at the moment how um, discrimination in the workplace is actually uh, against like uh, peer workers is dealt with because like there cannot be any like meaningful upscaling of the peer workforce as we're seeing after the um, Royal Commission um, without organizations taking this shit seriously. So actually fucking sack them. Like there needs to be meaningful consequences because like, you know, there's numerous stories of, you know, when this doesn't work in these mainstream health organizations and it's the peers that get hung out to dry. Yeah. They face the consequences yeah. of the, like of, of feeling isolated, um, under-resourced, underfunded, stigmatized and yeah. It, and then sacked. Cool. And then sacked for, you know, uh, doing essentially what they're being employed to do. And there's a larger conversation about how, you know, how does a government employ people for the same thing that it's criminalizing them for? <laughs> um, and like, we need allies to like step up and hold space for us as well, you know? Um, and I mean, I guess the, the other aspect of it is just keep, keep killing it. Like, you know, no one can connect with these communities, with our communities, like a peer worker can. And it, it is, you know, as simple as that. You cannot engage and, you know, perform meaningful work with people if they fucking resent you. Because, you know, whether it was you or everyone before you 20 years ago has treated them like shit for accessing your services, well then, 
guess what? So, you know, peers are the future. We know this. There's so, we, there's so much value that we can kind of add to this space. And um, yeah, it's about time that they uh, actually commit to it. So yeah, sack them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just add, like, um, yeah, I suppose it, it doesn't just come from your own organisation as well. Like, I've been targeted from uh, not all 12 step peers and lived experience peers, but 12 step peers have been targeted and tried to be brought down because I've used drugs and I've been a peer worker. And um, they think anyone that um, is a peer worker should be total abstinence and never touch a mind altering substance again. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's not just from your own organisation. Yeah, yeah. Can I... Uh, oh, sorry. sorry, but am I, am I able to say something? <laughs> I'm already here, so I'm just going to say something. I'm anyway. into it. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to really... I really want to say I commend everyone who's in the li living experience roles, you know, because I understand I'm in a lived experience role and I do... I, for myself, had to go into abstinence for my own self and the, obviously the war on drugs and the policies that we face and the harms that had on my life. Um, so that's just how I have to roll in life today. Right, um, you know, I have children and I guess if I use today, I'm gonna lose any contact and stuff that I do get to have with them. So I have to be mindful of that. But I really wanna commend you all for, you know, being in the living experience roles. And as I was listening to everybody, I was thinking, fuck, why wasn't this around, like for me, like why wasn't this around when I was using, like this would have helped to help me to help others, to support others. So anyways, I was just reflecting on that stuff, you know, so like, you know, I stand in solidarity with all living experience workers um, and peers, so thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, for the other... The other Say something for myself. Say, Christian. <laughs> so, hi, you guys are sick. Christian's from Fuse as well. <laughs> yeah, um, I am the facilitator of the Fuse Network. My name is Christian Baker. I work at Harm Reduction Victoria. I didn't need to move this mic anyway. Come on, get on with it. <laughs> Come on, Christian. Oh, okay, what someone else wanted to clap after me. So, that's why I <laughs> closer. so um, I would say a couple of things in terms to answer a couple of the questions that were asked. I do want to acknowledge um, the um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are not only the traditional owners of the land that we meet on at the moment, but they also support um, living experience um, work constantly with what they say in their voice. And at the moment, Australia is in a moment where we are emphasising how much of a difference uh, living experience can make when it's involved in the decision making, the planning, the delivery and the evaluation of services. Um, I want to acknowledge Indigenous people for um, emphasising that in their current campaign for a referendum and uh, how much it supports like our work as well. And um, we stand in solidarity with them and uh, continue to pull results in, um, not only for our sake, but to support each other and our allies. Uh, and the other um, answer to another question was, um, uh, as facilitators, we're running a workshop on how we do Fuse Network uh, tomorrow at lunchtime. It's at 12.30, so you've got time to grab food before you get there. And um, yeah, we'll t we can talk about more of the uh, behind the scenes stuff of Fuse. So come along to that. Thank you so much. Any more questions? Yes, please. I think, well, actually, I want to address, um, I haven't, we, oh, we haven't finished yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to address the other question about the, um, the manager that hired for different peers. Um, yeah, I think different, like, like individualised training for each person as well, it sounds like, when you've got heaps of different people, maybe asking them what they want, too, in terms of training stuff. Um, and I think reaching out to the FUSE coordinators and like, yeah, asking them about that, like Mills and Nards and like Christian and Matt, that's like what their jobs are, right? So like, yeah, you utilize the experts. Um, and like allocating roles to different people according to their strengths as well. You know, like we've all got different skill sets, right? Um, 
so yeah work from that and then figure out what extra training people need I think is like one suggestion for me did you want to say anything else? yeah oh. yep, yep. yeah um, yeah just so there's a couple of questions around uh, managing supporting and training peers and um, I think um, comes down to having good proper organizational readiness training um, that's really important um, I mean, yeah, I'm in a senior role now, um, and um, there's a few people that do the already training out there, but I think the best, the best people for us would be Harm Reduction Victoria, like they'd be best suited. Um, so I'll be getting um, them to do it. I mean, there's some other people out there that, that, that do the, the specific training, and um, yeah, I've just I felt a bit of prejudice towards the living experience from the person that does it. Well, then um, that's really important, right? Yeah. Because when you're living experience, you have that, or, yeah, you have that knowledge of like what that peer work is going to be going through. Yeah. So, like, yeah. of course, harm reduction Victoria is well placed yep. for that. Definitely. And um, yeah, um, just like with managing them and like supporting them as well. Like, I think external supervision is really important. Mm, Definitely yes. external yes. supervision, so they can feel comfortable. And with the right person, like I was talking about before. Um, so they can really feel really comfortable and open up about really what's going on for them and get the right direction um, from that person as well, which is what I'm getting from meals in the front here. Yeah. Lena? Uh, hey, yeah, uh, my name is Lena Van Hel. I'm a sex worker and I'm the manager at Vixen, which is a 100% sex worker peer organization here in Victoria. Um, and I had a quick question for Dr. Chaudhry. Um, you mentioned as one of the strategies that you guys implemented was a task force about sensitizing um, people in the community and locals. And I think it's like really interesting strategy. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit about how that's gone and what the process has been to set that kind of thing up and kind of some of the approaches to, um, you know, getting uh, you know, neighbours and people in the community and like immediately around the services that we offer on site because it's a, a struggle for so many of our services to, you know, deal with um, and be present in the neighbourhoods that we all exist in. Yeah, thank you. Uh, especially uh, earlier days we, we had like a DIC advisory committee so every drop-in center, there is an advisory committee, which is uh, basically uh, chaired by the house owner, then the local uh, administrator, and other key stakeholders or uh, key el uh, elites or influencer. But we found that uh, the most harassment is done by the law enforcement agencies. So not only uh, uh, people who inject drugs, also uh, the sex workers and other, other uh, key population. The harassment is really done by the uh, law enforcement agencies. So what we think that uh, maybe if we, we, we involve them, so they can learn about the uh, key population intervention, they can learn about the HIV program, the importance of the program, and what it contributes in the, in the society. So we plan to, uh, like every, every, we call it Thana, that means uh, one area, uh, there is a, a police station. So they manage all these things uh, around. So the head of that police station is, we call OC, officer, of officer in charge. So we make them uh, the task force head of the operation in charge of that Thana police station. So along with him, like some uh, uh, religious leaders, as we are Muslim uh, uh, country, so uh, Imam is one of the part, then religious leaders, and uh, like uh, local elites, uh, government officials, high officials, like uh, the administrator, and other key stakeholders. We put them together and form a task force so that Everyone uh, in this area, if they have any, any uh, issues like uh, arrest or harassed by the local uh, guys, 
they can inform the o uh, officer in charge through phone so that they can cont uh, contact immediately and do the needful. And also we have uh, one focal point in every drop-in center, who is the drop-in center manager. So he can communicate with this uh, task force head, the police officer, and so this can be done immediately. So we started these things in uh, NFM 3, uh, already maybe one year uh, just we, we have done this. So maybe um, uh, by next couple of months, we'll do a further assessment whether it is working or not, how the harassment has reduced, or the sensitization gone up or not. So it's still uh, uh, it's a source of piloting. If it is work good, maybe in uh, next time, even next conference, we can, we can plan to present a, a good one. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? No questions? Yes, please. Sorry, just a quick comment. Um, I just wanted to commend the courage that any person that has living experience and is open about that in their workplace, I just want to commend your courage. Um, and I see the value in what you do. And I must take such a brave person. I commend you all on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was so much of like, the session was quite vibrant. And uh, in this harm reduction conference, we'll be largely talking about harm reduction, uh, drug policy reform movement, and movements for human rights. This can only be made possible through the power of peers. F by the peers, for the peers, and to the peers. Woo! Yeah? So, Thank you so much, all. Thank you so much.